So this is the seventh film in the Rethinking Existentialism series, uh, and it's entitled Bad Faith and Cultural Values. Um, in this series, I've concentrated on a difference uh, between the two varieties of existentialism that you get in the works of Beauvoir and Sartre uh, in 1943 and in 1945 at the time of the existentialist offensive, um, which was uh, 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 attempt by Beauvoir and Sartre to launch their philosophy as a, as a kind of major cultural influence uh, in the rebuilding of France after the Second World War. Um, and they, they argued for uh, a kind of shared philosophy that they summarised with the slogan, existence precedes essence, but there are important differences between the two varieties of existentialism. And I spent uh, an earlier film, I think it was film four, um, uh, explaining those differences. And what I want to do in this film um, is explain why I think that by the end of the 1940s uh, Sartre has changed his mind uh, about uh, existentialism and he has adopted Beauvoir's variety rather than uh, continue to argue for the form that he uh, initially set out in being a nothingness. Um, and the problem, the reason why he changes his mind, the problem that he faces uh, I don't think is internal to the philosophy of existentialism itself, right? I don't think um, he's particularly bothered. There are problems with his variety of existentialism right from the start, but I don't think he's particularly bothered by them. Um, I think that uh, from the texts, it looks as though what's really changed his mind is that he can't give a satisfactory the cultural theory uh, a satisfactory theory of the origins and and transmission of cultural values uh, around groups of people uh, on on the basis of his initial form of existentialism, but that he can, uh, if he adopts Beauvoir's form, uh, I'd say that's the way he goes, and that then I think uh, transforms his philosophy quite quite thoroughly. Okay, so first I'm going to uh, talk about the difference between Beauvoir and Sartre for a bit, and then I'll explain the problem. Uh, that Sartre faces. Um, so the difference is this, right? So they both agree that existence precedes essence. So they both think that uh, an individual's behaviour um, is guided by the reasons that they find in their experience, that they find in the world, the reasons to do this or that, the reasons to think this or that. Um, but that those reasons are shaped, particularly the, the, behavior, the reasons that shape behaviour, um, uh, simply reflect the values that the individual already endorses, right? So if you, um, if the sign that tells you to keep off the grass seems to you to be a reason to keep off the grass, that's because you value uh, doing what you're told, or you value not getting into trouble, uh, or you value not standing out as a troublemaker, or something like that. Uh, if your values are very different, you might read that sign that says keep off the grass as a reason to walk on the grass. Right? So the idea is that the, the, the reasons we experience in our behaviour actually reflect our own values and that those values are ones that we choose to endorse and that we could change and we could have other values. That's the core idea of existentialism that Sartre and Beauvoir agree on. Where they disagree is over the idea of sedimentation, as I've been calling it. So on Beauvoir's view, the longer you endorse a particular value, the more you act on it, the more you employ it in your decision making about how to behave, uh, the more firmly embedded it becomes. It becomes a, a more um, a deeper and more significant, a more influential part of your cognition. So it just it has more influence over your behaviour uh, the longer you've been acting on it, and um, as a result, it becomes more difficult to overcome it. You can't just choose a new value and the old value will disappear because it's become firmly ingrained in your system through all that repetition and all that habituation. Um, whereas for Sartre, um, he, he has a theory of radical freedom, um, which is based in his metaphysics of being and nothingness, which we're not really talking about in these films. But because of those metaphysical commitments, he thinks that, um, that no, uh, values that you endorse, the projects that you pursue, as he calls them, um, uh, have no inertia of their own. They have no 
influence or force of their own. They only influence your thought or behaviour to the degree to which you still endorse them, uh, you still agree with them. So if you uh, choose a new set of values or a new value to replace an old value, that's it, you, you're done. The old one's gone and the new one's in place. And that's what he calls radical conversion. Uh, or radical freedom is the ability to do it. Radical conversion is the ability is uh, is his name for changing your whole outlook, your whole system of values. Now he thinks there are reasons why people mostly don't do that. Um, uh, people become very attached to the values that they've got. They they do value the things that they value, so they don't seem to have any clear reason to to change those values. But they could, and. Uh, he builds a, a theory of psychoanalysis that says that you know sometimes the problems that people face in their life are caused by the values that they have and that the values uh, that they have can be changed they can just choose to see the world in a different way and that their lives will go a lot better as a result. Now on Beauvoir's view um, things aren't that easy although you can choose new values they don't automatically and easily displace the old ones because the old ones have become sedimented or habituated. So uh, instead it takes a kind of ongoing uh, process of sedimenting the new values, which may be uh, taking as long and be as, uh, as uh, uh, complicated a process as sedimenting the old ones was, even though when the old ones were sedimented, you didn't necessarily realise you were doing it. So Beauvoir elaborates this view um, most, uh, 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 in most uh, detail, I think, in her book, The Second Sex. So she thinks it's the upbringing uh, of, of boys and girls which sediments into their outlook particular kinds of values, which provide them with uh, a different outlook on the world. So that boys and girls grow up to be men and women, and men and women are different genders, they have different uh, uh, priorities, they have different interests, they have different goals, and that's all because of the projects and values that were instilled in them through their upbringing. Um, and once they are adults, they're in an adult world that continues to reinforce those gender roles, um, but also because they are adults who have these ideas deeply sedimented into their own outlook, um, they tend to reproduce those ideas in their own children. Uh, and other people's children by policing their behaviour in a ways that um, uh, sediments the same values. Right? And so the system perpetuates itself. Um, now on Beauvoir's view, um, the, the values that have been instilled into you through your childhood can be overcome, but not in a simple way like the way that Sartre seems to think that you, in his early work, that, um, that you can just come to realise that they're causing you trouble and just choose new ones. Rather, she thinks that they become sedimented, even if you've rejected them, even if you are uh, a, a more free thinking, more liberated person who doesn't want to uh, uh, live up to their required gender role. Um, it's still difficult, she thinks, because one of the reasons it's difficult is that the values of that gender role are still deeply part of your outlook. So you're kind of in conflict with yourself, um, at least until such time as you have worked through the process of sedimentation and habituation and, and kind of grown into your new outlook. Um, so Sartre, as I say, wants to be able to uh, explain uh, culture and cultural values without that notion of sedimentation, right? Beauvoir clearly uses sedimentation to explain why it is that particular cultural groups have values and, and projects in common, uh, because that's her theory of gender and she indicates in the second sex that you know, in principle you could um, uh, use the same theory to explain other kinds of cultural groups though you would have to be sensitive to important differences uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the ways in which um, different cultural groups operate um, but nevertheless the same idea of sedimentation could, uh, could explain the generation and transmission and reinforcement of a cultural outlook in a particular group of people, uh, a common set of values to a particular group of people. Sartre, of course, isn't going to explain it that way in his early work because he doesn't believe in sedimentation because it, it conflicts with his theory of radical freedom. So in his view, um, uh, 
Well, what is his view? That's the question. How is he going to explain how a, a, a group of people, um, a culturally identifiable group of people, uh, can have projects in common, values in common? How does that happen? Um, and he addresses this question in a book he wrote in 1944, in October 1944, in fact, uh, so that's after the liberation of Paris, uh, but it's before the end of the Second World War. Uh, and um, one issue that people were discussing in French culture at the time was, as they saw it, the question of um, how uh, uh, Jewish culture fits into the wider French society. Uh, and Sartre wrote a book on this, um, which is in English is under the title um, Anti-Semite and Jew. Um, and Sartre's view is that there simply is no question of how uh, Jewish people should um, fit into French culture. The only question he says that's facing France is how to overcome its long-standing uh, problem of anti-Semitism. Um, and to argue for this, he says, um, he, he develops a theory that says, look, Jewish culture, insofar as there are um, values in common among Jewish people, insofar as there are um, projects in common among Jewish people, that's as a result of Jewish people living in a common situation. That, that is a situation, a climate, a wider climate of anti-Semitism. Right? He says, you know, one of the key features of being Jewish in French society at the time is that you live in a, a wider society that is flavoured with this uh, anti-Semitic um, outlook. And as a result, you need to find ways to deal with that. Okay, so he wants to say that the, the common values, if there are any common values, or insofar as there are common values among a group of, a cultural group of people, are due to their having a common situation, a common uh, context uh, that they're living in. But of course, on his theory of existentialism, that's not quite going to work on its own, right? Because um, according to his theory of existentialism, the reasons that we find in our experience, the reasons that we find in the world reflect the values that we already endorse. So to say that Jewish people live in a, in a, in a, in a situation of anti-Semitism and that that's the same situation for all of them, um, kind of misses a step. It's not the same situation for all of them unless they all have the same values in the first place. Because otherwise, the anti-Semitism that's there will strike some people as a reason to behave one way and other people as a reason to behave in another way and other people as a reason to behave in yet another way. The reason that it constitutes for, for, for an individual, right? the, the, um, the, the, the kind of consideration it is, the importance it has and the, the, the kind of directive significance that it has depends on the individual's own existing projects. Right? That, that's the theory of existentialism that Sartre is committed to. So he can't just stop the explanation at that point. He can't say people adopt common projects if they're in common situations because they're only in common situations in the important sense if they've already got some project in common. And for that reason, he has to trace culture, his cultural theory has to trace back to a kind of single common project among all members of a given culture who, not necessarily all members uh, of the cultural group, but all members uh, who, of that group who um, have the common values uh, of that cultural group, the common outlook of that cultural group. So if we were talking about genders, it wouldn't be all men or all women. It would be all all men who subscribe to a kind of masculine uh, view, traditionally masculine view of what it is to be male, or all uh, women who subscribe to a traditionally feminine or exhibit a traditionally feminine view of what it is to be a woman. Um, uh, and in the case of, of uh, uh, Jewish culture, he says, you know, it's it's uh, it's not true that all Jewish people have anything in common, um, but there are. Uh, kind of common values and common uh, uh, projects among that are uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, prevalent among Jewish communities, and so what he's trying to do is explain how that happens. Um, so the project, the only project he can really um, uh, identify at the root of this, the common project uh, for all people, is uh, the project of bad faith, a project of inauthenticity, and he says in. In this book, he says, oh, don't take this as a moral term. Right? There's no moral judgment here. It's just that there are two ways. If people are classifying you as a particular kind of person, there are two ways in which you can 
respond to that. One is by asserting uh, that existence precedes essence, asserting your true nature as a, as a human being, a, a true structure of human existence, uh, that you don't have an ethnic nature and you don't have any other kind of nature, you don't have any uh, particular individual nature either, uh, any fixed personality either, but you, you have your own projects and you adopt your own values and that's who you are. That's authenticity. And he says, you know, authentic people, they don't really have anything in common apart from authenticity because they, they, they are pursuing wildly different projects because they, they understand that they can. Um, it's inauthentic people who tend to, as a result of their inauthenticity, um, see uh, their situation in a particular kind of way, which leads them to formulate particular kinds of values. So he says that Jewish people living in an anti-Semitic climate um, will respond to that anti-Semitism by rejecting the picture of Jewish people that the anti-Semite has, but they'll do that by trying to um, uh, uh, demonstrate the opposite, right? So if uh, uh, the anti-Semite says that Jewish people are untrustworthy, that will be taken by the inauthentic person who is Jewish uh, as a reason to be as trustworthy as possible and as publicly and obviously honest and trustworthy as possible, um, because that way they're kind of demonstrating that uh, the anti-Semite is wrong about the nature of Jewish people by trying to demonstrate a different nature, a different essence of Jewish people. That's, that's Sartre's idea. And as I say, so this, this as, a, as, a, as a theory of culture has come in for a lot of criticism. It immediately did, um, and it still has for lots and lots of reasons. And uh, I'm not going to list all of those. Um, there are plenty of things wrong with it. I think that what's important for our purposes, for, for my interest in this uh, stuff, is that lots of those criticisms really are manifestations of the same problem, right? Which is that, which is that that it that it has to. Um, place all the emphasis on this, on bad faith, on inauthenticity. And the fact that Sartre says, look, there's no moral judgment here, that's not enough uh, to, to, make this, um, to make this theory uh, acceptable. And here's the deep reason, I think, why the, the theory doesn't work, okay? Which is, what he's trying to do is explain the prevalence of, of a particular value among a, a group of people, actually any group of people. Um, uh, and he does it by saying, well, it's only, you know, values spread like that only when a group of people who are in bad faith, who, who, who are, have an inauthentic approach to life, um, uh, have also have a common situation. And as a result, they've got a common project and a common wider context. And that's why they find com the same reasons in their experience as one another. And so they behave the same way in response to those reasons. And the problem with this is that bad faith itself is a cultural value, right? So uh, he hasn't explained how all cultural values are spread and are transmitted because um, that is one, right? And, and all of the explanation that he's given rests on the assumption that bad faith is a fairly widespread project, not universal, not everybody uh, has an inauthentic approach to life according to Sartre, but it's a very common thing and it's something which, um, which actually uh, society kind of uh, pressurizes us towards, uh, but he can't explain how that is, right? Because his only explanation of cultural values uh, rests on the assumption that bad faith already is widespread, but it is a cultural value. So why is it why is it widespread? Why is it something in common among lots of people, most people? Um, Sartre simply can't explain that. So bad faith, the, the, the widespread uh, existence of bad faith turns out to just be a, an, not just an unexplained coincidence for Sartre, but a totally unexplainable coincidence. They, he has, his theory has no resources for explaining it, and any, any way you could try to explain it is going to require uh, a revision to the theory. And as a result, um, any cultural theory that he tries to build is going to rest on this big unexplainable coincidence. Now, if there's another way of explaining uh, 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 these cultural phenomena that doesn't rest on an unexplainable coincidence, then that other way is a better, better explanation. And that's the shortcoming of his initial form of existentialism. And um, 
as we've seen already in this talk, there is a better way to explain the prevalence of cultural values, even within the context of existentialism. And that's Beauvoir's way of doing it. The idea that values just become sedimented as a result of childhood upbringing um, and as a result of um, uh, um, the kind of reinforcement in adult life of um, uh, those cultural values is something that doesn't just apply to gender, it can apply uh, to any kind of cultural values. In fact, it can apply um, to the cultural value of bad faith as well. If you buy the idea that there is such a widespread project, um, Beauvoir can explain it where Sartre can't. Now, I think that that ultimately is the reason why Sartre changes his mind. By the time he writes saint Gene, which is published in 1952, he uh, believes in sedimentation. He thinks that projects uh, and values are communicated uh, around cultural groups, primarily through childhood, through sedimentation of values in childhood. Uh, and that's how he explains um, uh, the, the, the characteristics of, of Jean Genet, uh, who's a poet and professional thief and friend of Sartre's, who he wrote 500, 600 page uh, psychoanalytic biography of um, the lesson there is never be a friend of Sartre's. Um, so by the time he writes that, which is published in 1952, he agrees with Beauvoir about sedimentation. Essentially, he agrees with the view that Beauvoir has articulated in um, The Second Sex, the form of existentialism in The Second Sex, which is published uh, in 1948 and 1949. Um, but actually, he, I think, has already you can already find that change in Sartre's existentialism a few years earlier. You can find it in 1948, about the time that uh, Beauvoir is publishing um, The Second Sex. Sartre wrote a, an essay about, um, uh, it was a preface to a book of poetry by uh, black writers, uh, mostly from the um, uh, former colonies, or well, the colonies at the time, um, uh, of uh, France in um, uh, 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 the West Indies and in Africa. Um, and uh, the, the essay is called Black Orpheus. And I think in Black Orpheus, it's quite clear that he's already moved away from his old uh, uh, endorsement of radical freedom and begun to see the world through, through, the, through the lens of Beauvoir's existentialism, which rests on this idea of sedimentation. Um, so that, in essence, is why uh, of the initial two varieties of existentialism, it's uh, Beauvoir's that wins out.